Good morning, y'all. Princess, welcome back. It's so good to have you guys here. Congratulations. And of course, for those who know or maybe don't know, we also are welcoming into the world uh, Baby Crassa. Woo! Baby Boy Crassa uh, yesterday morning. Hey. How cool is that? Hey. Bartholomew. You what? Bartholomew. Bartholomew Crassa, I think. <laughs> well, welcome everybody. I was going to say at the end, too, especially um, one thing that Maddie and Kevin had sent out, if you just want to be praying for them, um, the delivery was good, but it was pretty tough on Maddie's body, I think. I think. Baby Crassa was like 10 days late, right? And so if you just want to be praying for her, I know she would appreciate that and she would love everybody's prayers and be prepared for our endless string of meal trains that we're always, we're always doing meal trains. So be prepared to make something yummy for them. Yeah. We're continuing on in the Gospel of John um, as we're walking through the story of the man born blind. Uh, Here's something I was reflecting on this week. What does the phrase, put your money where your mouth is, mean? Do what? Did you say eat it? <laughs> eat it, yeah. But seriously, what does it mean? Put your money where your mouth is. Do what you say you're gonna do. Do what you say you're gonna do, right? Or like, uh, put up or shut up, right? Um, I, I feel like I have an uh, I don't know why this happens to me. I assume it just happens to people who talk too much, which is a category that I would fall into. But I have a lot of like, put your money where your mouth is kind of moments because I just can't stop talking. And so I'll say things and then the Lord will bring it back around and be like, did you really mean that? And it's like, well, I guess I did. Yeah, I guess I really did. I was thinking about it this week where I was speaking at one of our, um, at our Westerville Alliance Church. And I was just like going hard on um, the next generation for leadership and how the generation that's here now is called to sacrifice for them and to develop them so that the church can be what it needs to be. You know, the whole spiel. And um, I was going, I was doing pretty good. And what I did not realize at the time was that our national office recruiter for Alliance Ministries was in the audience. Her name is Amy. And we got to talking afterwards and she's like, I just love what you have to share about empowering the next generation and like giving them space to fail and like taking risks. I'm like, yeah, I mean, I just, I believe it. She's like, she's like, uh, we're gonna gather all of the juniors and seniors who are in ministry at our Alliance colleges and bring them to Columbus. Would you guys want to host all of them? and like just talk about all the things that are happening at your church and i was like oh yeah 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 for sure for sure you know and she's like yeah yeah it would be great and i was like and how many is it she's like it's only like 130. and i was like oh yeah <laughs> for sure for sure at the time like and this was different then but at the time we were literally like 25 people we had like four young adults. We barely were even able to make coffee on Sunday mornings because of how disorganized we were. But I could talk a really good game. And so she got really, we weren't even meeting here. We were meeting in the Unity Community Center. We ended up meeting, we ended up doing that here. Um, and it ended up going great. We still do it. But it was like, uh, it was one of those moments of like, oh yeah, I guess I, I really did say all those things. And I really do believe it. So let's see what happens. It's been a really cool thing for our church to invest in and for our young adults to see, but put up or shut up. And that's what I think is happening here in this story, in kind of our third out of four phases of talking about the man born blind, right? He has been through a lot in his life. He's having some weird interactions post healing and specifically now where he's at, the Pharisees are going to call him back in, right? And they're going to put his feet to the fire in a lot of ways. And he has to choose how he's going to respond to what's about to happen to him. And it's a really interesting interaction. And so as we talk about this, my hope is simply this. 
this is what we're going to kind of meditate on. I think that Jesus asks us to be ready to drop anything temporally, earthly, to gain everything eternally. I think that's kind of the testimony of the man born blind, man born blind's life, right? I think that's what we can learn from his reaction to being, I mean, in a very real way, persecuted by people who are supposed to be leading him. And my hope is that the Lord will speak to us today as we talk about these things and as we meditate on what he has to say. So let me pray for us and then we'll jump into this story and do some reflection. Would you pray, for, pray with me? Jesus, we're so thankful for you. We're thankful for what you have to say to us. We thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, we just invite you into this space to say and do what you need to do. Would you speak to our hearts? Remind us of your goodness. In your name, amen. So the story so far, here is it. here it is in a nutshell, ready? There's a man who's born blind. Jesus heals the man who's born blind. Everybody, his neighbors, his parents, the disciples, the priests, is either confused and or mad about it. But the man born blind is pretty stoked. That's pretty much the whole story of this so far. Uh, there's some interesting interactions, but the man born blind is really excited about not being blind anymore for good reason. So we're going to jump in at 924. If you want to follow along in your Bibles, uh, I'm going to be reading out of the NIV. John 9, 24. A second time, they summoned the man who had been blind, and they said, Give glory to God by telling the truth. We know this man is a sinner. This is what, in biblical terms, and we have this today, it's called a cross-examination. What's a cross-examination? Like in court. It's where the other side gets the question. Yeah, Absolutely. So they had asked him once, and then he had asked some questions, and now they've come back, and they're coming at him again. They're like, something doesn't make sense, or at least we don't like what's going on. Being brought before these religious leaders in this context was very clearly punitive. Like, he was in trouble. Somebody brought him because something didn't make sense, and they needed to make sense of it, and these guys are mad about it. It's a punitive action. In this moment, it was not a step of discernment. It was... Not a good thing. He's in trouble. They've interviewed him. They've interviewed his parents. His parents have kind of like kicked him to the side. They're like, he's of age, which means he's at least 13. And um, they're not pumped about it. But the first time, the Pharisees are a little bit divided. They've now kind of like regrouped. And now they're on the same side. They're on the same team. They all understand. And they've decided that the guy who healed the man born blind is a sinner. Just straight up. And so they're coming in with this assumption. They're ready to go. They're a united front. And what they're saying here in give glory to God by telling the truth, they're basically saying like, we know that you're lying. We know that some part of the story doesn't add up and we're gonna figure out what it is. So give glory to him. Hmm. Was he healed demonically? Was he healed uh, through ritual? Was he ever really blind at all? Was this like a long 13, at least 13 year con, right? Like a long con? Has he been faking it? Uh, but they're encouraging him to give glory to God. And the reason for this is because they've decided that the man who, that Jesus was a sinner. They, so they've thrown out all objective bias, which was supposed to be the point of this whole exercise, is we're gonna reach an objective truth of what's happened here. Like philosophically or otherwise for Jewish people, the goal was to give glory to God by finding out what actually happened. And the Pharisees have already decided that, that is, this is not gonna be the case. We already know what's happened, we're ready to go. Uh, and they've, they've gone so far as to even say, and this is what they, comes out with the parents, is the parents are afraid of being thrown out of the synagogue, which is what we're going to get to that at the end. But the reality is that, like, and there was previous chapters where they talked about this, the Pharisees have made up their mind, right? Or the priests have made up their mind. They do not like Jesus. They're not in for what he has to say. They're not in for what he has to do. They've, they're essentially, like, throwing out any sense in which they're going to be open to this. 
which is really going to be really fun then when we see what the man born blind, how he responds to what he has to say. And this is also the beginning of like a deep, deep irony for this moment. Because in ancient times, it was actually seen as like a sign of maturity to begin the premise with, I don't know if I know what happened. So in humility, I'm going to take the journey to try to find the answer. That was philosophically, theologically, that was seen as humility, which we're gonna see is like, the, that's actually the man born blind's position. The Pharisees are starting from a presupposition of like, we already know what happened here and we don't like it, right? Which uh, in every ancient writing we have is seen as a sign of like deep, deep immaturity and insecurity, right? So already we see this contrast in how they're reacting to this situation. Verse 25. The man replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. He's already admitted in a previous verse that he doesn't know a lot. He understands that. And he's kind of pulling like a Forrest Gump here. He's like, I don't, I know I'm not a smart man, right? Like he's kind of like sitting in the midst of that kind of moment. He gets what's going on, but he is honest. He's open. He's pretty sure this guy is a prophet. He's already said that. He probably thinks that he's not a sinner, but he's not sure. And he's holding on though to this miraculous experience that he's had. I was thinking about this this week. It's really difficult for us to appreciate how important an experience like this would have been for this guy, especially like post enlightenment, all right? So if you look at what he just said, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. The first thing they teach you in like Theology 101 is that Jesus did not sin, right? Does that feel fair? But the first thing that this guy said is, I don't know if he's a sinner or not. So his theology is not like awesome. Right, right off the bat, he's got some questions and there's just things that he doesn't know. But what does he have? He has this incredible, life-changing, life-altering experience with the risen, with life the risen, he is risen, but with the Lord, right? And he's just holding on to that as tightly as possible for us today to value knowledge above anything else in our world is so a new thing. It's just really in the last three or 400 years. This man does not have the best moments. He doesn't have the best words. Jesus' disciples also didn't have the best theology. They're constantly getting this stuff wrong. So he fits right in with this crowd, right? He knew his life had been totally changed. And so he was not willing to give that up. And that was enough for him to stand up to the most learned, most educated, most wise people in his community and say like, listen, I get what you're trying to get me to say, but like, this is the honest truth and I'm not willing to compromise on this, right? The, by the way, this is gonna be the exact same situation that the disciples get put in in the book of Acts over and over and over and over and over again, right? They're doing miracles for people. They get arrested, they get tried. And the number one response of the priests that are trying them is, the only thing we know about these guys is that they've been with Jesus. That's very clear. And it's true, they're not the most well-spoken, they're not the best people, their theology is still developing. They literally just got the Holy Spirit like uh, like a couple hours ago, right? But now their shadows are healing people and they're going out and they're preaching and thousands of people are coming to know Jesus and then they're immediately persecuted. And the number one thing, this is the thing that draws people, it's not like they wrote a book, it's not like they wrote this treatise, it's not like they give these incredible sermons, it's these people have been with Jesus. And that's what the man born blind is holding on to. He has not even met Jesus yet, still. He's not gonna meet him until the next passage. He does has not met the man who has healed him, but he knows he's had a life altering experience that he cannot let go of. And so they ask him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered, I've told you already and you did not listen. Why do you wanna hear it again? Do you wanna become his disciples as well? The best question in the Bible, in my opinion, is one of the funniest things ever. Do you want to be his disciples? And then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. 
which is a super convenient thing for them to admit because they've just spent the last two chapters persecuting Jesus by saying, we know exactly where you came from. You came from Galilee. You can't be from God, right? Now their story is, we don't even know where this guy comes from. Super convenient. So the priests are totally losing it. They've abandoned any sense of decorum, any sense of due process. They're just going to get this guy to admit that something did or didn't happen, right? They're mad. The man answered, now that is remarkable. I love this guy. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. And we know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. And if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. If you've ever read the Bible and said, is this sarcasm? You're, you're right. This is one of those moments, right? Like he is being genuine, but it's also like he's holding this right open in front of them. He's kicking their butt. Verse 34. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they did it. They did the big thing. They threw him out, right? What they threatened to do. There's two things in particular I'd like us to reflect on as we kind of like sit in the midst of this guy's story. And the first one is just to consider the audience of the Gospel of John. I think this is really important. It's what I've been thinking about this week. Forgive me if you've heard this spiel before, but it's always worth remembering and sitting in. The first century church, the context in which these documents were created, these stories were gathered, where they went around to encourage the church at large, was heavily heavily, heavily marked by persecution. And I, I know we all know that like the, in the rest of the world, there's an incredible amount of persecution and uh, we're all probably at least a little bit cognizant or aware of that. But I would invite you, if you've not done so, to listen to the stories of the church around the world of what they are going through. And then you will begin to understand and really understand like, that these, th these documents, these gospels, this good news that was written for the people who received them was such good news, right? As these things were actively happening to them in real time in the first century. As the Gospel of John was not just a really good book, but was something that like spoke to their souls in their real life experience, right? <laughs> All of this persecution continued on for about 300 years in various degrees of intensity. So when you're talking about the Gospels or Paul's letters or Peter's letters, you see over and over again this call and this hope for people who are ostracized, and people who are hurt, people who have been killed, people who are maimed and wounded in the midst of all that. And the stories are wild, which is exactly what Jesus said was going to be true of them, right? That you will have trouble in this world. And so while we read this as the story of a man who would stand up under intense ridicule for absolutely ridiculous reasons, what was true for John's audience was that it was still illegal to say that Jesus was from God, right? This is post-death and resurrection. This is a community of maybe like 30 people sitting in a room listening to the gospel stories of John being read, and they're saying like, yeah, we still can't go to the synagogue and like say the truth about Jesus, otherwise we're gonna be kicked out, right? People were being abandoned by their Jewish friends. Disciples were being thrown out of the temple, which was their spiritual home, which is not only where like religious service happened, but also social and economic service. This guy is putting everything on the line. This is a social sacrifice. This is where his friends and family hung out. This is an economic sacrifice because Jewish people would not visit the stalls or like take part in the economy with people who've been kicked out of the temple because they've now been like ostracized. They are out of the community, right? This is a spiritual sacrifice at this point because this man has no promise of the church at this time, right? This is a physical sacrifice. There's all kinds of things happening here that he's, maybe he would say he didn't even understand how big this was, but he was willing to put everything out there. It was real. And this was the example, this is the, the experience of the early church. Hmm. This man was moving from an experience of being a beggar born blind who was ostracized and alone to potentially going back to the exact same reality, just not blind anymore, right? Now, even with his sight, he was going to be ostracized and alone. They asked him, 
to glorify God by telling the truth about what he had supposedly lied about. And he glorified God by telling the truth about the man who killed him, right? By telling the truth about Jesus. That's the reality of the situation. And he kind of cheekily invites the Pharisees to do the same thing. Like, I'm going on a path and you guys should join me. And this would have served as tremendous encouragement for the first century church, like the reality of their situation. I think the challenge for us today, as we sit in the midst of this story, we don't really experience the same kind of things that they've experienced in the world. There is a reality in which I think Jesus asks us over and over again what we are willing to sacrifice and to not sacrifice for the things that he's put in front of us. Whether that is an economic reality, whether that's a social reality, whether there's a spiritual sacrifice, a physical sacrifice. I think Jesus is always asking us, like, how much are we really willing to give away for the sake of getting closer to him, for intimacy, for glorifying him? And I don't think, I mean, I can't tell the future, but I, I don't know what the future is going to look like in these spaces, but I, I still don't think a lot of us are going to experience the reality of that kind of persecution, to be honest. And so the question becomes, like, what do we do, and what is, well, how do we move in the opposite direction? Because here's what we are experiencing. This is a quote from Russell Moore's book, um, Losing Our Religion. It's kind of long, if you'll excuse it. He's talking about kind of the history of how our Protestant faith has come about in America, and I thought that this was really insightful. He says, we're a de-church, or what the new term is, like, exvangelical, in the early 1920s was likely to have walked away due to the fact that she found the virgin birth or the bodily resurrection to be an outdated and superstitious or because he found modern libertinism to be more attractive than the outmoded strict moral code of his past or because she wanted to escape the stifling bonds of a home church for an autonomous individualism now we see a markedly different and even jarring model of a disillusioned evangelical. We now see young evangelicals walking away, not because they do not believe what the church teaches, but because they believe the church itself does not believe what the church teaches, right? The presenting issue in this secularization is not scientism or hedonism, but disillusionment and cynicism. Christianity Today's number one book that was voted as the most helpful or like most helpful resource last year for, it was either this year for 2023 or 2022, was a book about combating apathy. The reality of American apathy towards our faith and the reality of what we experience. I think without the sacrifices that Jesus asks us to make and as we sink deeper and deeper into comfort, which inevitably just kind of honestly makes us lazy and stupid and kind of tired and eventually like really worn out from seeking after our own stuff i think we get to a place where we end up a lot like either like the pharisees upholding some kind of like weird strict moral religious code that doesn't have any room for any kind of flexibility or an experience that's different than you or you leave right like you're done with this whole thing and you're kind of tired of it and it's not serving you and especially when you see like these people who supposedly also hold on to this thing uh not really doing very well or not really practicing any aspect of it you leave like that's just the reality my fear is just that we could there's times where maybe we've lost track of the fact that we have the greatest message that's ever been told right I think we can lose kind of the beat on that. That God himself, out of love for us, came to be like us to save us, right? And is still present with us. He was incarnated, perfect, sinless, present savior, who's willing to meet with us today, day after day, even in the midst of all of our stuff, even in the midst of all the ways that we fail, that he's constantly building in us the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All the things that a lot of people who are like into self-actualization would say, oh, I really want peace. I really want love. I really want joy, right? Who could use a little bit more joy? There's a million books written about like happiness, but only the Holy Spirit can give us the capacity for joy that surpasses understanding. 
for a peace that totally breaks through the walls of anything that's happening to us in the present. This is what we have in front of us. It's, it's ultimate satisfaction, right? It's eternal realities. And also gives us a community in both love and suffering, right? A lot of us can find a community that will love us no matter what we do. A lot of us could find a community that might be willing to suffer with us. But I think the church is uniquely equipped to do both in a very unique and cool kind of way. I just don't think there's anything like it. And it's because of the Holy Spirit that we can do that with one another. And to offer us the wisdom of the ages on how to live a good life. That we've got thousands of years of resources from faithful men and women who have gone before us to show us what it means to follow Jesus well. I just don't think there's anything like it. But it's not without refinement. It's not without fire. It's not without sacrifice. It's not without giving a, a lot of stuff up slowly and surely over time, but without a lot of sacrifice, frankly. It's hard. We have so much to live for. And the question then becomes with Jesus, is the sacrifice worth it to get there? And for this man, it was. He was willing to sacrifice everything that he had, even the things he didn't really have, the things he had literally just gained, right? He was willing to sacrifice everything. This was an encouragement to the audience of the Gospel of John. The other reflection I have is just about the nature of spiritual leadership and the deep irony that's in play in the midst of this conversation between the man who was born blind and the priests of the day. A lot could be said about the nature of the priest leadership at the very least, like if you read the Bible, even in a cursory glance, you're gonna be like, these guys did not like Jesus and they don't seem to be doing their job. If you can make out those two observations, you're killing it. That's pretty much the whole story for the priests, right? They're not doing a good job. A pivotal moment in this exchange between these two groups that is so important is the invitation of the man for the Pharisees to become disciples of Jesus because of their response. They say, verse 28, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of who? Moses. For those of you who know history, Moses had died like 2,000 years ago. Like he's been long dead, right? We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from, right? This is the subject of a whole chapter of the book of Hebrews. I think it's Hebrews 3. But basically, like the thrust of Hebrews is Jesus is better than everybody. And very quickly, as the writer of Hebrews establishes, Jesus is better than Moses. Like, he's superior. Don't worry about it. Moses was great, but Jesus is better. Right? And that's great. Moses did hold a significant mantle of authority and leadership in the Jewish faith. There's no doubt about it. Every single prophet that comes after him is like in the line of Moses. He was the first. That's how they understood this all. And so as you go boom, 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 as you go down the line, these priests are essentially saying, like, we are taking on this mantle. We are leading the way that Moses did. We are also leading the people. We know he was given the Torah, so now we enforce it the same way Moses did. Blah, 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 blah. The priests played a significant role in Israel, super important. The high priest, especially actually after the king died, became the spokesperson for Israel. Like when Rome came in and they're like, we're going to invade you. It would have been whoever the high priest was to kind of negotiate that whole experience. So he was a really big deal. And then you've got like chief priests who were like all over the temple. And then you had like some more common priests and then it just went lower and lower and lower, right? Here's the thing with the high priest. The high priest was established for this sole purpose. He was chosen by God. And then he was the guy who was supposed to be totally pure. Like they would check, and this is going to sound gross, they would check every crevice of this dude's body to make sure that he had no cuts or boils or scratches or rashes. Because he was the only guy who was going to walk into the presence of God in the Holy of Holies and hopefully not drop dead, right? Because of the pure glory of what was manifest in there. He was supposed to be as sinless as humanly possible in ritual sacrifice. They covered him with all kinds of stuff. And then they would tie bells to his ankles. And if the bell stopped ringing, he probably didn't make it, right? This was a very serious job. But the reason for it was to offer in the presence of the Lord the sacrifices of the people, right? It was a beautiful thing. There was supposed to be one high priest, one high priest who was chosen by God. He gets brought up. He dies. You pick a new high priest. It was an important job. In the time that the Romans came in, 
They totally took over the reality of this. The priests had completely compromised their position. In the time that the Romans were there, we're pretty sure there was at least 28 high priests. And at the time that Jesus was around, 16 of them were still living. It had become this weird thing where whoever was important at the time or like these, these families that like were con like were sucking up to the empire or whatever, they're like, well, your son, like we need to put him in a powerful position, make him a high priest. He serves for like 10 years, then they knock him out and they put in a new one. And then you have all these people, like at times when you see the Pharisees or the priests gathering and they're like talking about amongst themselves, it's all these retired old, old high priests who are supposed to all be dead right to be able to serve and now they don't know like they're retired and they're bored so like we're all going to serve the temple i guess but there is this one guy who's been elected right there were two even in the time of jesus father and son the dad had not died yet right very weird stuff the point is that they had totally compromised this role they totally compromised this position they obviously could not walk into the holy of holies without going right The chief priests were in a similar spot. It goes from top to bottom. They had become totally ineffective at the one thing they were created to do, which was to provide spiritual leadership to the people. They had stopped being helpful. They had said they were disciples of Moses. But here's the thing, and this is the damning part of this. Moses and his spiritual leadership was known for one thing, intimacy with God. He is the only person in the Bible who God calls his friend. A lot of people call God their friend. It's the only time where God recipiates is Moses is my friend, right? He's the only one who saw any portion of the Lord because he requested it. He's like, Lord, I want to see your face. And the Lord's like, we can't handle that, but here's my back, right? And he came down from the mountain and his face was literally shining, right? He would spend so much time in the Holy of Holies that he would be glowing when he came out, just praying, right? He was known as a friend of God, God's friend, right? He was known for his intimacy. What, and we've been talking about this for a couple weeks, what's the number one accusation that Jesus has for the priests of Israel in this moment? He says it over and over and over again. What does he say to them? You do not know the Father. You think you do, but you don't. And they're totally unaware of it. They are in no way in the line of Moses, maybe in their heads, maybe in their thinking, but in no way do they identify or incarnate the role or the spiritual leadership of Moses. They have no spiritual authority, they have no spiritual leadership, and they have no intimacy with the Father, which was the one thing that Moses' spiritual authority was founded on. Yet they had totally lost it. You do not know the Father. And then Jesus says again and again, I know the Father, right? That's why I'm here. You have a we, as the, as the priests say over and over again, we think he's a sinner, right? And Jesus always comes back, he's like, well, we, his we is the Father and I. We are not convinced, right? This is not okay. So over and over again, they're going back and forth. Here's how Rob Reaver defines spiritual leadership. It's finding the mind of Christ and then doing it, right? That's all spiritual leadership ever really turns out to be. Obviously, that's overly simplified. But the, finding the mind of Christ is an act of intimacy. It's an act of experience. It's an act of discernment and authority and learning from the God of the universe. It's the deep, and the deep, deep irony of all of this is that this man who had been born blind, who'd been ostracized from his community, who hadn't been allowed to worship, who had just been sitting by the side of the road forever, after having one healing experience with Jesus, is epitomizing what it means to seek after the mind of Christ. He is the one who is holding fast to the reality of what he's experienced. He is the one displaying true spiritual leadership for his people. He's the one who's willing to look left and right and be like, let's all go after this together, which is what the priests were supposed to be doing, right? Let's figure out the mind of Christ. And the implications for this are huge and far reaching, to say the least. But not the least for in our spaces of leadership for all of us, regardless of what you do or where you work, whether it's by authority of position or just because people care about you and what you have to say. If you're in a position of leadership over others, secular or otherwise, at the very least, like you are called to serve in the same way Christ did. Like that would be like kind of the lowest portion of a lot of that, right? Even if it's not in your job description, that's the reality. 
spiritual leadership in so many ways is just like absorbing a tremendous amount of pain and passing on blessings to the people that you lead. That's the reality of like what you're trying to do. But then especially in those spaces where you have spiritual leadership, right? Like in your relationships, in your home, like in any space like that at work where you have it, in discipleship relationships, where you get to actually practice like the authority and spiritual leadership you've been given, your call is so much to seek the mind of Christ in that moment. And in that relationship, what is the mind of Christ for this right now? And then how do I do it? right it's not to perform it's not to get a raise it's not to create shiny children it's not to like put up a new fence it's not to get the nicest house it's none of those things right what is the mind of christ for my family and how do i do it what is the mind of christ for this position that i hold in my work and how do i do it what is the mind of christ for me in the midst of discipleship relationships that i'm in or people I'm just ministering to who do not know Jesus, especially, and how do I do it? Over and over and over again. That's what spiritual leadership is. That is the question that the priests are supposed to be asking over and over and over again. Of course, at that time, it was Christ. It was the mind of God, right? It's to find the mind of Christ in intimacy with him. And if I could encourage you to one thing, and one thing only, right? Do not sacrifice your spiritual leadership to chase after things that have no eternal value. Don't sacrifice your role as a parent. Don't sacrifice your role as a leader. Don't sacrifice your role as a brother or sister or as a child. Refuse to sacrifice what's been put in front of you to chase after things that have absolutely no eternal value, right? Your kid, and I, this is fresh for me just because my kids are young, your kids are an internal inheritance. You're gonna give them some money, you're gonna give them some stuff, that'll be great. Your kids are going to live forever, just like you are, right? Somewhere, they're going to live forever. And you have been called as a steward to have spiritual leadership in their lives. How do we do that the best we possibly can? Because there are constantly gonna be things that come in that try to butt out your intentionality as a parent or whatever, right? Whatever role that you're in. Again, this is just fresh for me because I'm I'm a new parent and I'm still trying to figure out literally everything. But like, there's always gonna be things that are trying to butt out that reality. Always, always, always. And we have to be so vigilant to not be like, oh, well that would be really nice. And I know I have to sacrifice this moment I could have with my kid or this level of intentionality I wanna have, but like this would be a nice thing, right? Don't fall for it. Every time, refuse to sacrifice. I think, like the man born blind, we're really called to risk everything, everything that we've got to get to Jesus because he is worth it. He's worth every bit of it. He's worth everything that we can give him. He is acting for our good. And the man born blind knew that. He didn't know a lot. He didn't even know if Jesus was a sinner or not. But he knew at least that, that this is worth going after and it's worth sacrificing everything for. And something had changed in him that was foundational and concrete. And for us, I think he stands as an example of what it means to let go of so much that seemingly has value for the sake of gaining more of Christ. More and more and more and more. I think that's what we get to sit in today as we consider his life. So at Delco, we always have a time of response in some way, shape, or form to just sit in the midst of his word and the things that we've heard and just really hear what the Lord has to say in the midst of all of that. Let the Holy Spirit speak to us and respond. Hey, buddy. What we do not want is like the parable of the seed that sometimes seed can land on hardened ground and as Jesus said, like creatures will come and they'll take our seed and they'll make off with it, right? We want to not let that be the case as much as possible so we're going to take a couple of minutes there'll be some music playing in the background um, just for some moments of silence and reflection i have some questions up here that you can use as a prompt but if you really feel like you know what you want to pray or think about that's totally fine but in what areas asking the lord this in what areas can your goodness sustain me when i am tempted to compromise for temporal gain 
to where is God calling me deeper into finding the mind of Christ, mind of Christ in leadership? And then three, very simply, how can I live it out this week? Is there any area that he's very clearly targeting and saying, like, I really need to step into this kind of obedience, this kind of intimacy? And I pray that he says something to you. I'm going to pray a blessing over everybody. And then um, I'll step away. We'll have a couple of meds and then I'll come back up and do announcements. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we come to you with open hands. Lord, whatever we would have in them, whatever thing that we're bringing today, whatever kind of resistance we would bring, Lord, I pray that we would just be willing to lay that down this morning. I pray that you would give us the capacity to hear your voice. Lord, that any obstacles to that in our heart would be removed in your name. Lord, we know that you don't reveal anything in our hearts to shame us, but Lord, solely for our good because you love us. So Lord, as we open up the suitcases of our hearts, would you just reveal any piece of us that needs your love, that needs your spirit, that needs your healing? Speak to us, Lord. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. So I'll come back up in about five minutes. If you want to use your phone to journal or your journal or the cards at the table, feel free.
Ford's fidelity is so good to us that he's always willing to meet us right where we're at. We don't have to do anything to get there. He's always willing to speak to us. So pray that um, you experience that this morning and experience his word and his voice and his presence. If he's brought anything up that is, you'd like to process with anyone or would like help, please never hesitate to reach out. Um, it's something that we love to do and we love to sit with people with. It's a joy of it for us. We've got a couple of things coming up that I'd love to bring your attention to. As always, on Monday nights and Tuesday nights at 545, we gather here to do the Dream Center to serve the underserved in our community. Um, there's a lot of oh, there's a lot of folks who need um, a lot of folks who need help in Delaware, and we love being part of that, and we love partnering with the Dream Center, who we share this space with. So, if you have questions about that, you can actually use the QR code to sign up for emails and texts, everything else. You can also use it to sign up to ask questions about any of the things that we offer, any of the places that we partner with. Um, and we'd love to help out with that. One specific thing, and I would really appreciate for all of us to consider is, we are gonna partner with Dream Center, Center for one block party in particular that they do, which is a party at uh, London Town Apartments on Saturday, August 19th from 11 to two. They need volunteers and they would love for Delco to show up and represent as much as possible. We do have a sign up for that through the QR code. And as we're getting closer to the date more and more, we'd love to be able to give Nathan an idea of how many people are willing to volunteer. So if you could please use the QR code with your phone to sign up for that, that would be awesome. I understand that usually like for folks with young families, maybe we'll get one of you, but I do know that if you wanna bring kids or stuff, although for us that's prime time nap time, uh, so at least one of us are going to be there for sure. Um, so please make that a priority. We would appreciate that uh, if you'd sign up for that. Back to School Sunday is August 13th where we're going to pray over staff members, students, everybody who's in the school system and just pray a blessing over them and celebrate them as they're getting ready to enter into the next round of really working for the common good of our community by making schools a good place for students and the teachers. So join us for that if you would. And then also coming up is our Missions Week, August 27th through September 3rd, where we're going to celebrate what God is doing around the world, not just uh, with, with Alliance missions, but also here in broader, like uh, in Ohio and Kentucky and other spaces like that. So we'd love to have you guys for that, and those are things that are coming up. So as we clean up today, I know there's food. Please join us for lunch. We're having soup, I think, and some other things. It's going to be good. If you would gather the centerpieces that are at your tables and actually put them at this front table right here where Randy's at, if Randy, you raise your hand. If you could put all your centerpieces there, that would be awesome. And we'll gather in like seven to eight minutes to pray together and then eat some yummy food. Sound good? Break.